Skyler, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you, Melissa? I'm doing fantastic as well. I just got back from vacation, so I am oh, all there refreshed, you go. relaxed, and set to go. Nice. Well, that's Pursuing the Comfortable, if I have to say. Yes, and I do recommend that. Esso. <laughs> Skyler, where are you joining us from? Um, I'm in northern Utah, near Ogden, so right next to the mountains, which is awesome. Yeah, I hear it's pretty beautiful out there. Yeah, it can be. We've had a couple of hot weeks, but today it's been quite a bit cooler than the last couple, so we'll take it. I bet. I bet. So, Skylar, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so I host a personal finance podcast. It's called Money Talk with Skylar Fleming. The whole premise behind it is that we just don't talk about money enough. So I came to say that we need to talk about it more. It's a topic, that if we talk about it, that's the only way that we're going to learn more about it. There's so many different little nuances and little different ways to optimize your money and do this, that, and the other that we're never going to learn on our own. So we just need to like start the conversation. Absolutely. And I know people love talking about money, right? <laughs> yeah, at least I do. Most people don't. That's why one of the jokes about why I started my podcast is that my wife was tired of me always telling her the same stories over and over again and all the different optimizing that we needed to do. So I started the podcast so that there's other people to listen to to me go tell somebody else <laughs> yeah she loves to listen and she loves to loves to hear me out on the ideas but i was just droning on and on so that's what my audience gets to hear me do now well it is awesome i have to say you give the impression that maybe it's just boring money talk but it is a great podcast the link is in the show notes so i encourage you all to check it out yeah Skyler, thank you how did you oh you're welcome how did you get into this yeah, getting into it really, it was almost it was three or four years ago, I think. I was working at a credit union and I was a call center agent. Then I went to a supervisor and a tier two supervisor, which meant I took like the really angry calls, like the people that were very upset that the credit union wronged them and stole the million dollars out of their account. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. But I just found most of the time these issues weren't because the credit union did anything or because the person specifically did anything wrong. It's because they just didn't know any better. They didn't know how to avoid overdraft fees. They didn't know about, maybe they were in a hard financial situation, but they didn't know how a line of credit might be able to help them or things like that. Like they just didn't know the strategies that were out there for simple things like budgeting, money management, paying yourself first. They just thought everything was monthly payments. And that often led to overdraft fees, late payments, things like that. And just once you started to have a conversation with them over the phone, people would calm down once they got out of that aggressive state of just being upset at the world. Mm -hmm. But once you just started to have the conversation, then I was able to find a lot of the times that you could teach people a way to maybe adjust what they're doing or help them just understand the issue in a bigger picture. So that led me to think, wow, we just don't talk about it enough. So then combined with me always researching it and wanting to tell my wife about it and tell other people about money, I was like, wow, people need to hear about this topic. So then I started my podcast. Well, that sounds great. What an interesting story. And uh, what was it like working at the call center? It was uh, busy. It was definitely busy. There were seasons where it wouldn't be busy, but then Christmas would come around and really it was really the school year was when it was busy. Summertime, it wouldn't be as busy, but working at the call center, always busy. I loved being a supervisor there because even though most people would probably say, I don't want to take any of those angry calls. Those ones were the most fun. Those were the challenging situations where you had to really stretch your mind about how you're going to make the system work, both for the business and for the person who you're helping over the phone, but those escalated and angry or bigger situation calls were the most fun to, to handle. And it sounds like you have a real knack for that. Yeah, I love problem solving. That's that's my go-to, problem solving and building systems to help people out. So it was fun. Well, let's talk about a little what-if scenario, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, what if a family has, you know, a little bit of credit card debt, a little bit of student loan debt, and a mortgage. Everything else is okay. They're paying their bills on time. Uh, how would you encourage them to 
what kind of fin- financial plan would you encourage them to have? Do you pay off the credit card debt first, do the student loans? And let's put a pen in anything happening through the laws and forgiveness mm-hmm. and anything of that nature. Yeah, there's always unknowns there. But yeah. I guess I would just start with, I always start with the basics because I think that's where there's always a lot of room to be made up. There's always a lot of places where people just, like I've said, don't talk about it. They don't know that there's a different budgeting strategy other than figuring out where every single dollar is going in that overwhelming fashion of sitting down for a month for multiple hours. They don't know that there's faster, simpler strategies. They don't know that there's strategies to build on paying off your credit cards. They don't know like those simple strategies. So I would start and say, hey, let's look at your goals. Do you want to be out of credit card debt? Or is there something maybe more super near term that you're focusing on? Because maybe you don't want to change your whole financial life because you're going on a vacation in two weeks. And you don't want to cancel that. So let's maybe like, let's be realistic about it. I think that's the best way to start with looking at situations like that and then set those expectations as a group and work through that. So what are a few different strategies? Is that something you talk about or is that something reserved for when you work with clients individually? Yeah, we definitely get into the strategies on my podcast. We get into those debt payoff strategies like the snowball or avalanche method and things like that. But a couple of the strategies as far as some of the basic things It's making sure that you have direct deposit set up and that it's set up in a way that helps you, which means usually setting it up so some of it goes to a savings account. It's very easy for your HR department to do that. And then you're immediately knocking out that first step of saving some money. You can always get the money later if worse comes to worse. But one of my favorite books is The Automatic Millionaire, which talks about how once you start making that money go to places automatically, you're going to figure out how to live on the rest of it. Your lifestyle is going to be fine. It's going to adjust and you're not even going to miss it. So honestly, aim for those higher savings targets right when your paycheck comes to you. That way it's getting directed to a savings account immediately. And then you start looking at things like budgeting. The 50, 30, 21 is one of my favorite things to tell people about. It's where, I can't remember the specifics, but 50% goes to one bucket, 30% to another, 20% to another. I want to say it's like 50% to, I don't know, it's needs, wants, and bills or something like that. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Sorry about that. But there's like specific strategies like that, that are a whole lot simpler. And you can even tell your HR department, do 50% to this account, 30% to this account, 20% to this account, and then your budget's done for you automatically. So I'd say like, look at those steps between your paycheck getting from your employer to you. I didn't know that was, I don't have an HR department. I'm self-employed. But wow, what a bonus. Yeah. And HR departments are generally willing to do that. Yeah, I would I would say every every company I've ever worked for in the past 10, 15 years or whatever has always had some sort of payroll uh, form that you can fill out where it says write in your direct deposit account and routing number and then you write how much wants to go there. And if you only list one, they're going to put 100% there. But if you were to list multiple accounts, you could list a specific amount like $200 per paycheck or a percentage. So it's the same way with like a 401k form where you put in a percentage of your income that you want to go to that account. Well, that's fantastic. What a great strategy. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you adjust. Mm -hmm. If you have a little less, you just adjust. You cut a little bit here, a little bit there. And generally you don't notice that so much. Yeah. And it happens in the same way when you get raises, like the whole premise behind lifestyle inflation is that you just keep growing your lifestyle to fit your income. So if you're shrinking your income a little bit, then you're just going to naturally adjust your lifestyle to shrink to fit that. And then you're going to be fine once you realize and get into the process of talking to your employer about their 401k plan and talking to your coworkers on how they're investing in the 401k. When you have that money automatically going there and your lifestyle is adjusted down and then suddenly years down the road, you're finding your 401k has a ton of money in it because you just kind of forgot about it. And then you maybe you can vamp up your lifestyle a little bit. It's just, it's really fun when you start looking at ways to, I guess, uh, make your paycheck automatic and optimize from that aspect. And you don't have to have the willpower or the discipline with that method. It's already taken care of. And like you said, if a rainy day comes or something, the money's there and it's yours, you (laughs) can get it. But you don't have to do the willpower game or the discipline game. It's just already done. Yeah. How much harder is it for you? Like, let's, I'll give you a hypothetical here. Let's say you get a thousand dollar bonus. And if that money isn't automatically being diverted places, what's the first thing you want to do with that thousand dollars? Well, I want to pay off any debt first. That's always my go to. I don't know if that's the best thing or not, but uh, I don't know if I should invest it first. 
Mm-hmm. But generally, if there's any kind of debt, then that's my first priority. Yeah. So that's, that's a priority in your mind. Oftentimes people, they'll, everyone will have different priorities. So for me, I'm so focused on money. It's going to be some sort of investment or debt pay. Give it to someone else or put it in an account. I don't know. There can be a lot of variations on that. But like you said, you remove that mental bandwidth that that takes out of the picture if things are automatically set up to happen. Automation is one of my favorite topics to talk about because so many people don't know the simple steps that you can take that really help just reduce your mental strain when it comes to money. Well, when you have small children that you're in charge of, bandwidth is a real yeah. thing. When you have one less decision, even if it seems so minor, it can be major when you are just overwhelmed with decisions all day long. And mm-hmm. not only for people that take care of children, but there are a lot of people out there with professions that demand a lot of decision making having less of those and capitalizing, see how I use that word there, boy, capitalizing on the best strategies. That sounds like a win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep it simple. I think, I think that's really a lot of what I like to talk about is keep the strategy simple. Don't overwhelm yourself with which stocks do I have to pick today? Don't overwhelm yourself with trying to optimize every little detail. Just start simple, start small, get that ball rolling. And then eventually if you want to, you can take those steps to further optimize, or maybe then you're good. Like if once you set up those simple steps and just have conversations with some friends about I'm drowning in credit card debt, how, how do you guys manage your credit cards? And then maybe you realize four or five other friends also have a ton of credit card debt and that makes you feel less stressed about it, or maybe less judged because you realize more people are dealing with it. But talking about that sort of stuff can be a little tricky right out the gate mm-hmm. because it is kind of a conversation that carries a lot of weight, but there might be the one friend in there that says, yeah, I spend credit cards but, or I spend with credit cards, but I use all my points for all my free travel. And that uh, flips a switch in your head that says, I want to learn how to do that. So that begins your journey of getting out of debt and understanding how to use that better, just from a simple conversation about credit cards. So I would say just start with little conversations around like some of those financial pain points or curiosities in your life. Now back to automations, we can automate how the money comes to us from our employer. We can automate, you know, bills that we pay monthly. What other automations are out there and available? Yeah, those are the main ones I think that are so important is automating where your paycheck's going and then automating your bills. Like, especially if you're to a point where you're not living paycheck to paycheck, like don't worry about if you paid your credit card bill or something like that. Like if you know you can pay it, set up that automatic payment. Um, Other automations. This is one that I did an episode a couple months ago about with someone who's really, really focused in on this more than I am. A couple other ways you can automate. There's a couple of awesome tools out there for automatic investing. Like M1 Finance is a popular one where you just put the money in the account. It buys everything for you. You just set it up once and kind of forget it. Um, Other things to automate. I don't know. I'm a huge spreadsheet nerd. So I like having that sort of stuff automated, but that's maybe a little more detailed than (laughs) I usually go into unless someone really specifically asks. But I'd say there's, there's really countless ways. Think of a task that you do often which most of the time for people with money, it's managing bills and managing where their money is like going, like budgeting and things like that. So if you can figure out ways to automate that, then I think really you're going to be fine. No, I've seen products like Acorns that takes 10 bucks a week or a month or whatever amount mm-hmm. of time you set up and just invest that. And it happens automatic. You don't have to think about it. What's your take on those types of services? Yeah, I'd say give them a shot. Like if you're not investing anything, then probably a good place to start. Absolutely. Like take, look at those services that make your life a little bit simpler and watch two or three YouTube videos, reach out to maybe one of them and say, Hey, what's your thoughts on this? And then just give it a shot. I would say if you're testing tools like that, test it with a limited mindset, like only for the short term kind of thing. Don't plan to move your entire financial life over there because of this one little feature they have. But I always say like, give those kind of tools a shot because you might find out, wow, this is exactly what I needed. This kind of round up my doll, round up my transaction to the nearest dollar and invest that is just enough to get me started that now I'm more interested in the rest of the investing landscape. So I think those tools are great for starting money talks and for starting conversations around how are you investing? Because, yeah, you take what you just said of what your guys' thoughts about these tools where it's rounding up my purchase and you ask your friends that and then you guys have a real good conversation about investing and maybe you learn something new there. That's fantastic. I hear a pattern here 
of talking to friends. Yes. Talk to friends, talk to spouses, talk to family members. I would say the easiest one to talk to is going to be friends because money can be a really tricky topic in families. So I would say start with friends that you're uh, closer to with your money conversations. So what other general advice would you offer for folks that uh, say you're just getting to a point where you're out of school, you're starting out and you don't have a lot of responsibility Mm. yet? How do you begin a responsible relationship with your money? Yeah, I would say my first like foundational advice is make sure you have at least like one month's worth of pay in your bank account. Because what that allows you to do is one of my favorite strategies to teach like all my family and friends is budget based on last month's income. So to explain specifically how it works is my wife and I will get our paychecks and we do nothing with them. They just go into like our general savings account. And then at the end of the current month that we receive those paychecks, we'll say, okay, what are we looking to spend over the next month? But we'll limit ourselves to only be able to budget that amount we got paid. So that way your paychecks are sitting in your account for two to four weeks at a max, but you're not even touching them. So you're almost living kind of like a month behind your paychecks, but that allows you so much flexibility in the fact that we're receiving our utility bills and things like that. And we're like, okay, this is how much it is great. Like you just subtract that out of the amount that you got paid last month and you don't even worry about it as much Mm -hmm. because you have that little bit of flexibility. And then from there, uh, look at ways you can cut down on spending, start tracking things as essential. You don't necessarily have to budget every dollar, but I would say start at least with tracking your expenses so you can understand where your money's actually going. Now, my husband and I were gifted a CD many years ago when we first got married. And it wasn't a huge amount, but it was a substantial amount. And so we just left that CD with the local bank because we can get a loan anytime we need it with that CD. And it's, I think, two percentage points above the CD. Mm -hmm. And that's been a really useful tool for us, knowing that, okay, if we don't like to take out loans, we prefer to save and then buy. But, you know, sometimes life gets random and you got to do what you got to do. And knowing that that's there has been a real boon for us. But yeah. people also say, well, you're silly for having that in a CD. You should invest it somewhere else. I think that's the fun thing, though. For like personal finance, it starts with the word personal for a reason. Because yeah. for my wife and I, we, the last couple of years or the last year, she's been in PA school. So that's a big expense that's coming up, student yeah. loans and things like that that we're dealing with. And for me it's not as closely tied to who I am. For her, the student loan debt is her education. It's her career. Like it is who kind of who she is right now because of the student loan debt. So for me, I'm saying, wow, the student loan payments are coming around. Let's make sure we only have enough to pay the minimum payments because we'll be fine. Your salary is going to be fine. But for her, she expressed to me, no, we need to get out of this debt because that to me, that feels like I have to work as long as we have that debt because we've talked about maybe taking turns working and staying home with kids and things like that. So like, The personal part is for us, it's going to be paying off this debt earlier. For some people, it's going to be investing your maximum amount of money and paying minimum payments on things. For you guys, it's keeping that CD as that emergency fund, so to speak, for a loan on it. Yeah. And I like how there's not just a right answer. Mm -hmm. There's a right answer for you. Or maybe even a better answer is Mm -hmm. a way of saying it instead of. Yeah, an optimal for yourself kind of thing. Yeah. Now, on your website, uh, you have some fantastic freebies. Uh, I like, and people can go there. They can give you their email address and sign up for these things. Uh, The seven money talking points guide. Mm -hmm. So if you're not good about talking about things, this looks really promising. And the other, the six behavioral finance tips. Those are actionable steps that one can take to be in a healthier place financially. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about those and how they've yeah. helped you or others? Yeah, thank you for bringing those up. And you don't have to give me your email to sign up for it. So if you're tired of like giving email away, giving your email away, you can just mm-hmm. click the little X on the pop-up and then still access the document. But I think the, the whole point behind the seven money talking points is that it's so essential for us to get talking about money. I wanted to maybe, I think every personal finance podcast has their seven to 10 steps for a better financial life kind of thing. There's the baby steps. There's 
the financial order of operations and all those sort of things. And I wanted to maybe shift that through a lens of how do you actually start talking about those, whether you're single or in a relationship, like what are some of the main questions that you can ask about how to invest? I have a couple things on there. What will you do in emergencies? That's the really everyone's first step in their steps to a better financial life is build your emergency fund. So this having a conversation around it for my wife and I, it's, well, we can keep a leaner emergency fund because we have savings in other places. For someone, it's, we need to make sure we have a healthy emergency fund because we have six kids and there's always an emergency going on. So <laughs> it's just these topics and questions that are going to help you maybe find that uh, optimal strategy for yourself. So there's ones of how am I making money? How am I spending money? How am I saving money? Do I want to pay off all my debt? What do I want my retirement to look like? And what are my big money goals? So it kind of walks people through just a different perspective of those common seven to 10 steps that everyone shares of ways to optimize your finances. Well, and I know within five minutes of us concluding this conversation today, I'm going to have a printed out copy of that for myself. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for putting that together. I know that it's a critical time to have these conversations when people are dating. People that have never been married that are young and are dating need to have money conversations. People that are divorced and dating. It's hard having the mm -hmm. money conversation, but it is so important because if you're going to have a long-term relationship with someone, whether you're married or not, their relationship to money is going to have a huge impact on your life. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so important to talk about it. It's one of those things that impacts every aspect of our lives. Like money's going to touch everything you do in some way or another, where you, whether you think it will or won't, unless you're like completely off the grid or something like that, money is going to impact what you're doing, whether it's having to stay at work because you need a paycheck to provide, or whether it's getting to travel because you were optimal about your savings and things like that. It's going to touch everything. Well, Skylar, it's clear that this is one of your core values, the responsible stewardship of resources, particularly of money. But I'm guessing that that spills out over mm -hmm. other areas of your life. So how else does this tie into your core values? Yeah, I mean, that one specifically, I think I've found myself wanting to do the best I can with money. So it bleeds over to things like, I don't know, recycling and being like a good member of the community and things like that, which is just fun to get involved in. Because when you start having conversations with people around those sort of things, then things get fun when you're doing projects together, you're helping people locally and things. Really, one of the main things I've learned is just start talking about things with people. It's the best way to like, get something done, obviously, like just have a conversation, ask people questions to say, oh, how do you how do you like this part of your job? And then you really get to understand them a little bit more. So I would say it bleeds over into just being more open and willing to have like interesting conversations with people, which turns out to just be really fun for me. Oh, yeah. And you never know what you might learn about another person. <laughs> that way. So Skylar, what else would you like to leave with our listeners today? Yeah. Well, I, this has been super fun. So I'm glad I got to come on here. This has been super awesome to sit here and talk about money for a little bit. So I would say go check out my website. It's just SkylarFleming.com. So you can also find it at MoneyTalk.SkylarFleming.com. My podcast is Money Talk with Skylar Fleming. All my links are always in the show notes to be able to contact me. And on the website, there's a contact us page. So social media, same thing. Money Talk with Skylar Fleming, wherever you'd like to find me. And those links are also in the show notes of this episode. And Skylar, I do know that you take individual clients in a coaching type mm -hmm. relationship. So if someone is really stuck and wanting some guidance, there's an opportunity there to reach out to you as well. Yeah. And I always have my doors open for a free consultation. So I'm always happy to take some questions and answer those. Plus, I love to talk to people on my podcast. So if someone has some interesting, interesting money stories, I'd love to interview them on those sort of things. Cool. All right. Thank you for joining us today, Skylar, and Thank talking so about this uncomfortable topic very yeah. comfortably. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.